Kia ora koutou everyone and welcome to this pull focus talk with artist Virginia Leonard for Art Collector magazine. My name is Sue Gardner, I'm coming to you from Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand and welcome to you Virginia. Whereabouts are you coming from today? Kamaki Makaro, Auckland, New Zealand as well. Yeah, hi. Hi, lovely to talk to you and we're going to be talking about one of your fantastic works today called Rip Legs and I thought we'd just rip straight into it so to speak and have a look at the at your image courtesy of Gal Langsford Gallery. So this is a major major work major new work of yours um, Ginny and I thought you could start off by setting a bit of context for us what are the materials we're looking at what what's the scale of this work? It's a it's a, it's a tall, I, I call it a tall work. It's tall and reasonably thin, and it's got a really narrow bottom. So it's quite, it looks quite unstable. It's not, but I've, I plan it to look really unstable. And it's probably about a metre 20 in height and altogether. Yeah, maybe a metre 30. And mm -hmm. it, it's in two parts. So it's got a top and a bottom, mm -hmm. but it's all been resined as one but I've made it in two parts so the top part originally was the same size as the bottom part but then I've taken a hammer to it and smashed it up and then reglazed it into a clumpy form and then I have it nestled inside the bottom part and it's made it's all made out of raku clay raku clay is really robust it's got a lot of grit and grout in it so you can really push it to the extreme and then it's glazed and then it has a whole heap of gold luster on it and then it has resin over the top. Great well that's a good description and I'll, I'll we can come back and have another look at the image but I thought we'd we'd switch to here because certainly you know even your, your description of the materials and the forms really pulls us as the viewer into this kind of curious experience because it's so tactile so visceral and a kind of a nervy, risky, quite unsettling response. Talk about the, this imbalance between the narrow, the narrow bottom, the kind of sense that things are, are pretty unstable. Um, it's been incredibly worked and, and manipulated with a hammer, as you describe. So um, with this kind of sense of kind of risk and unsettling uh, viewing, the title, of course, just ramps it up another whole level because it's called Ripped Legs. Well, you certainly don't hold back, Virginia. Um, it's a bodily experience for the viewer, but with this title, Rip Legs, is it a bodily experience for you too? It's a literal experience. I mean, often people think my titles are symbolic or they mean something else, but it really is a rip leg. Um, my work is all about my own body and it's, it's about chronic pain and bodily trauma. And I, I, my titles all come from memories of either my time in hospital or often early on, because I had this accident in London, often it all is formed from that first sort of six months in hospital in London. And when I was in the accident, I ripped, I literally ripped my leg on the side of the road. So I got dragged along and the flesh got ripped off my leg. So it's literally mm. ripped, even though it was only on one leg, ripped leg. So they've, my title's are always very literal. It, it, it means what it means. But also you're, you're um, translating that, that personal experience of pain into, into the, the voice, if you like, of the material. So you've got all of the cracks and the pores and the drips and a heavily manipulated kind of hand-built sculptural response to it. And it's very kind of expressive. I, I look at them and I think it's like an abstract expressionist painting in 3D. What's your response to... The, the experience you have of manipulating and working and pouring with these materials? I think I probably work on them in a really similar way as the early American abstract expressionists, which is that I'm kind of most interested in that period of art than in any other period of art, especially in that painting realm. And I do work in the same way, whereas I don't think particularly hard about the outcome of what I'm doing, which is, I think, probably quite unusual for sculpture. I just begin and I build and I build very, very quickly. And I try not to look at the work um, too closely as I go. I just go and I let my hands decide where everything's going to go. So, and then the same when I'm coming to the glazing, I, I really do treat it like an abstract expressionist painting. I just, 
allow my fingers to do the to do the work and I don't really stand back and look at it from an analytical point of view till near the very end of the work and then I'll use formal aspects in the work but for the most part it's it's an emotional unconscious kind of decisions making that I don't I don't reflect on it I just work and I go I call, I just go hard really I just go hard but in a way, when, when you're talking about this reference or right from the very beginning of your art practice, thinking about your experience with pain, how do you find that that experience impacts on the work? I think you talk about the idea that you're going hard, you're going right into it. It's a very in the moment experience where you like a lived experience with yeah. the materials. Is that how you feel in terms of its impact for you? I think there's more than one level on how I treat the, the I mean, there's a, there's a practical level, whereas I go into the studio and the harder I work, the less I think about my own body. So my mind's mm. taken away from what's going on inside my body at the time. And that's just a mm. practical thing. And I think a lot of people that suffer from chronic pain would share this similar experiences when when you have a purpose or you're in that moment you can disassociate your body from from that pain and just do the work mm. but then I, I think that I just naturally that language of chronic pain is so instilled in me that if the work is looking really even and structurally sound, I will always take a hammer to it and break it up and make it uncomfortable and make it cracked and pointy and shard-like because that's, that, that's my language because otherwise I can't express what I feel in my body because chronic pain doesn't have a language. It doesn't have a voice it, and it's very isolating a lot of the time. You know, I'm alone in this and... If when I'm in my studio and if I can make work about it, I can stare the pain in the face. It, the chronic pain is not my friend. You know, I do not mm. friend it. I don't look for it. But if I can make work about it, I can push, I can just push it back and I can give it a language so I don't have to try and articulate it with words because you just can't. Mm. I'm going to click back to the image again so that our viewers can can get another sense now that you've described that so fully. From my knowledge of your work, Virginia, this work actually is more restrained in the use of colour. Yeah. Uh, with the, the use of the white glaze, uh, pr principally white and gold, but there's still a real sense of, um, kind of sharp edges and things uh, in such a fluid state of mind. So the, the top part, can, looking at the image, can you tell us a bit more about the top part? Because to start with, the colour is different. And are there added things in there apart from the clay? No. I'm, look, uh, this work, it, it is quite white, which is quite unusual for me because more is more in my world. I yeah. made this work during lockdown. I was very isolated when I made this work. There was no one around. I work mm. in an industrial, my studio is in an industrial straight in estate and I was the only person in the whole, in the whole area. So I was mm. alone. And I think I made this work sort of to pare back the color and make it as minimal. This is, this is about as minimal as I can get. Yeah. And the top, because I, they're made in separate components, the top has all the color is in that top part. So there's a whole heap of color, but it's all hidden inside. As I've broken it up into bits, I've then reglazed them, I've hidden the color. It's all underneath of you push your nose in a little bit inside the work, you can see the, you can see that there's a lot of colour in there. But I wanted it to look, I wanted the top to be quite gold and to look really floral and ornate, so mm. ornate that it was slightly icky. Mm. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good description. Um, I suppose in a way, like there's parts to it that look like they're, you know, they're falling off. It's so intensely three-dimensional and bit like a mo moment, like a, or even a brush stroke, brush stroke frozen, frozen in time. So there's moments where you, it's just holding together and you just don't know where the sense of where the control is coming from. Yeah. yeah. And, and which is quite a nice kind of metaphor for, for this, um, you know, your own physical experience that you're describing. I kind of, wonder in the in the studio there who's controlling who is it well, the... <laughs> well that's a thing again it depends on how my body is behaving on the day at the moment my body's not that great so definitely the the big work is controlling me I don't have much control over it at all because I can't lift it at the moment so I've got to wait for some poor 
unsuspecting person to walk past who can help me lift the work around because I'm just not that strong at the moment. But um, I, I really try and let the work control me. I, I, I really want the practice to, to, to control the theory. And mm -hmm. if you overthink it, or if I come in with a preconceived idea of what I'm going to make, mm. it never works. It always looks laboured and overworked. And mm. my, the best advice I ever got was when I first started painting, making ceramics. And this really good friend of mine, who's a really talented ceramic artist, said to me, I made this perfect work. And he said to me, no, no, you've just learned way too much. Unlearn all of that. Don't mm -hmm. do it ever again. It was the best advice I got. And I do that. And I, I, make sure that I, that I work like that every time in my studio. Because as soon as I don't, the work invariably ends up being smashed up into another work or it gets thrown away into the bin. Well, that's a great way of thinking about it for, for, from the viewer's perspective as, as well. Take everything that you might have learnt before about how clay behaves, about how materials behave, yeah. and um, kind of throw yourself into this kind of world of risk, if you like. You, yeah, you're I'm sort of risking your making and you're risking yeah. your... And in particular, ceramics. I mean, there's a you know the hist there's a massive history of ceramics. You know, the tradition of ceramics and the form, and you know, people that are trained traditionally. Um, you know, I mean, I do honour it in the sense that every work has a has a has a, an opening at the top. It, it is a vessel like structure, and often they'll have little handles on it. But I don't allow myself to get trapped in that traditional voice of ceramics. Where if I did, I think the work would be very static and heavy and mm. I like I think my work has a lightness to it because of the unevenness and the and the precariousness of it. Thank you well look the precariousness of it could be its subtitle it's a fantastic um, spot to end on it and it's certainly something that comes across even in a digital image so um, I think the 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 kind of risky expression that you that you you bring into the materiality of it is very evident. So thank you for your time today, Virginia. All the best for your time in the studio and we'll look forward to seeing this work when we can. Thank you. Bye. Bye.